Right, good morning everyone. I um, hope you all had a good day so far. All right, and uh, welcome to this uh, um, webinar that we're going to talk about Revit and um, uh, look a little bit um, on uh, on what it can do for you in the architectural, structural and MEP environment. All right, so um, just looking at the uh, agenda, what we're going to look at. Uh, we're just going to introduce the topic and then we're going to um, just look at how Revit uh, can help you in, uh, as I mentioned, the various industries and uh, particularly um, I'll do the uh, architectural side and then we're going to, uh, my colleague Paul will do uh, structural and um, MEP and uh, the conclusion. Right, so um, yeah, so let's uh, get going. All right, so as you know, uh, Revit's been around for a while and um, it can be uh, used uh, in various industries um, from from architecture to right through to, uh, you know, even uh, uh, facilities manage management, uh, quantity surveying, etc. But we're just going to look at how it can help us in architecture, structural and MEP or uh, building services. All right, so... The idea, obviously, with uh, purchasing and uh, having tools is to ultimately save you um, time to, uh, you know, complete your tasks quicker and uh, in so doing, um, saving money. All right, so um, my part is going to be the uh, architectural part and uh, I'm going to look at just how Revit can be used um, in creating intelligent uh, objects. Um, obviously, these objects uh, contain some metadata that uh, uh, helps you with, um, you, know, um, you know, reporting uh, later on. Um, each object that you create is intelligent. So, if you create a, uh, a wall, it's a wall. Uh, if you create any uh, uh, um, component uh, like a door or window, and you place it inside that wall, then um, obviously that will then, um, you know, know that the, the door is uh, placed in a wall and uh, it will create the opening for the particular component. All right, so um, creating intelligent modeling allow you to, uh, um, you know, speed things up. We're also going to look at uh, some change management. If you make any changes, uh, maybe in this uh, example, removing the door from the uh, uh, wall, uh, what would it do? Would it close that gap? Yes, it would. All right, so there is some uh, change management uh, and uh, if you make any change, um, it will update, uh, uh, you know, according to what changes you've made. Also, look at live schedules. Um, obviously, in this again scenario, if you delete the the, the door, it will just be removed from the the, the door schedule um, numbers. All right. We'll also look at some of the materials and lighting as you change uh, some of those. How it, how it would affect your model, and uh, and and then uh, we'll look at some analysis. All right. So. Um, that's just a little bit of the agenda and what we're going to do. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just uh, start up Revit and then just talk about um, those uh, particular uh, topics. All right. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, after this architectural uh, um, idea, we're going to, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, uh, Paul, and he'll do the structural and MEP side. All right. Um, so, um, I've opened Revit. Uh, this is just a basic sample project and uh, what I'm going to do here is just talk about how intelligent modeling works. Right, so I'm going to go to um, a, a floor plan here and uh, you will notice that um, I've, I've got a, a bathroom here, it's a little building, um, you know, some bedrooms and it's a, um, you know, residential, uh, 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 you know, building. I've got some uh, information here. Uh, there's a bathroom and uh, some bedrooms. Um, what I'll also do is I will open the 3D model and then view these side by side. All right, so this initial one, I'll just uh, close down. All right, so um, <clears throat> uh, what I'll now look at is um, if you view the, uh, you know, the um, the bath and, uh, um, you know, I kind of uh, uh, view the bath on this side here. If I do make a change here and I move the bath uh, in that uh, position, 
you'll see the, the bath has moved uh, from one side to the other. And uh, if I do that, uh, uh, move it back, you'll see that uh, change. Obviously, you can you can do that in uh, in in plan as well, and it uh, adjusts in uh, you know the model and everywhere else. All right, so uh, just a little bit of change management, uh, I guess. Uh, if you make a change somewhere, uh, it just updates uh, everywhere. Right, talking about um, you know intelligent modeling and, and that sort of thing. If I return back to the to the plan. Um, and uh, I want to add, uh, you know, doors and windows. You'll notice that um, I have, um, you know, say, uh, a, you know, a door here. If I select that door now, um, you can see it's got some information behind it. It's got a certain size. Um, it's got certain information. If I edit that type, you'll notice that um, it's got various uh, properties. Um, these type properties apply to all the this particular door in your whole project. So um, uh, if I go and add another one of those, then uh, you know it, it'll just have another one. So this one is selected. I'll right-click on it and I'll say, you know, uh, create similar, and uh, you know I can place it there. If I do place it there, notice that the uh, the wall has given way with uh, uh, you know for that particular uh, uh, door, and it's opened um, the the gap up. Right, um, that's just uh, kind of placing a door, but you uh, or copying basically a door from what you have. But if you look at the top here, you've got a ribbon, and uh, that ribbon, uh, you know, allows you to uh, add components, door windows, uh, and, and such. Um, also staircases and a lot of things in the architectural uh, sense. Right, so if I do go to the door, and uh, I have ability to select uh, various uh, components. If there's a component that uh, that's not there, I'll show you now how to uh, um, go and uh, access that. Right. If you've got a, an object and uh, uh, maybe the size isn't uh, correct, you can go and duplicate that, maybe giving it a different size, as well as um, just making sure that the width is updated in the object itself. So I've just named it and then changed the. Um, um, uh, a size. Right, and uh, I've just added that 900 door. Okay, if I select that, it's a 900 door, and um, if I go edit, edit the type, you'll see it is a 900 width. Okay, so um, you add doors, windows, uh, etc. Uh, these are 3D components, and they get, get added to the model um, in plan, but viewed elsewhere. Right, um, Right, so just a little bit of more, uh, um, you know, change management and that sort of thing. If I go and draw a section through this particular building, that section has been created over here. And uh, uh, if I just uh, look at them side by side, um, you'll notice that, uh, um, you know, the door is there. And uh, if I select the door on the on the plan, you'll see uh, it's kind of picked up uh, itself over there. Um, if I remove the door, in, in plan, it obviously removes um, the particular item over here. Uh, if I just undo, you'll see it re, uh, obviously recreates it there. I can also uh, zoom in here and delete it in in in, uh, in the section, and then it just removes itself over there. All right. Also, so um, if I take this section line and I just reposition it, you'll notice that the um, the section also adjusts according to where this uh, um, uh, section line. Uh, passes through the building, right? So that's quite uh, um, uh, f uh, fast, and 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 uh, um, you know the, the change. Once you've made the change, it just updates the whole model, right? Um, now, not everything is 3D. I just want to look at the time. Not everything is 3D. So uh, um, if you do go and add a section, like um, the guys have done here uh, already, uh, this is a, as I mentioned a sample. Uh, model. So if I just look at um, you know a building section over here, a uh, longitudinal section on the right hand side, <coughs> uh, building section, let's uh, open that, you'll see that uh, um, they've created a section and uh, a little bit of a detail uh, area over here. Um, that wall detail, then um, notice the, um, you know, it's very low level of detail uh, as it goes through the wall there. If uh, if I open that particular detail, this is now at a higher level of detail. Um, this all might still be 2D, uh, 3D with some 2D uh, additions, but um, 
uh, just notice that uh, you do have a ability to set it to course mode and to find mode uh, showing uh, you know a higher level of detail as you go through these kind of wall sections and details All right um, it's it's now carried on with uh, more more of these details this is still 3d um, perhaps some 2d is added there All right so that uh, a typical uh, roof connection um, then gets uh, um, added and we have then a, another uh, view of this um, and here you might substitute your 3D model with 2D lines, arcs and circles and in here you would now uh, create and spend time to uh, uh, create your 3D or 2D detail and uh, present it uh, properly. Right, um, just uh, all these views that's been created can then just be assembled on uh, uh, you know, a particular sheet. Let me just uh, go to that sheet. So there's the, the, the initial uh, uh, view. Um, on the right is the, uh, the view of the uh, wall, uh, wall section and then the particular details placed on that sheet. All right, so um, these details could you know, all be 2D or majority 2D and a little bit of 3D and, and that sort of thing. All right, so um, not everything is 3D, so, which means that if this had been drawn up as a 2D detail and you make any change, that won't apply to this particular detail because it's, uh, you know, redrawn as a 2D uh, uh, information. All right, so if knowing that, it uh, obviously could uh, save you, um, you know, hassles later on. All right, um, the beauty of this being in 2D is that you can redo, reuse that uh, uh, 2D detail in future projects as kind of a library item. All right, talking about the library, um, earlier I mentioned that uh, you know if you add a door uh, and there's a not a door that uh, um, you do not have, you can uh, go and insert additional components by just going to the uh, uh, you know the library. Um, now this library is a, is, is a cloud-based system, and you can um, you know go to the cloud and uh, select the particular item, load it in and that will then be um, downloaded and be able to um, be used in your in your model. All right, so there's the, there's the component and I can just add it as maybe, a, let's just add it there as an external door or whatever. All right, so um, this particular sys, uh, uh, workflow is nice to just load uh, content from the cloud um, that's already uh, available there and uh, it's obviously free if you've got Revit. Okay, so um, just passing uh, uh, over to, so everything that you do in Revit, if it's 3D, it kind of um, is intelligent and uh, uh, at, uh, that door that we've added now in this section will be you know, shown in that section. It's, it'll be recorded in the um, schedules. So let me just uh, show a little bit of scheduling. Right, so if I <clears throat> look at um, this particular uh, model, and I'll go and just switch on the um, the uh, um, restrictions that it has here. It's got a little uh, section box. All right. Um, okay. So this section box I'll just uh, remove. Okay. So um, just displaying more of the, the the trees that I have there on the site. Right. Um, I'm going to just look at the. Um, I'm going to close all the interactive or the other windows, and I'll just open up, um, you know, the schedule of the planting that uh, they have created over here. Right. Um, okay. So again, look at these side by side. You'll see there's a couple of, uh, um, you know, planting uh, objects. Right. If I um, delete, uh, if I look at this guy here, it is a uh, honey locust, and if I look at those um, at the top there, uh, it's there's eight. Right, so if I take this item and I delete that tree, you'll notice uh, that um, you know there is now seven. So um, um, by changing the particular object in your model, it updates the model, obviously, uh, the plans, the sections, elevations, and even the the scheduling that I have here. All right, so um, that uh, works both ways so I can if I've got a, a door schedule or, or something I can actually change the the, the the item over here and it'll look then different in the model itself right so it goes it's bi-directional 
All right, and then just looking at a little bit of the solar analysis and uh, and energy uh, analysis. If I um, open up a view here, uh, again uh, on the three D views, um, it has a, a ability to position your uh, project in um, the particular um, area that it in the world and uh, you can set that up by just going to the location and picking off a um, uh, position in the world. Right, so in this case this is now Boston but you can put it uh, in anywhere in uh, in South Africa etc. Right, so I'm just going to leave it at, at, uh, at that. Um, you'll notice that you can also display the sun angles um, and that obviously is project wide so whenever I change this um, little sun um, I can just uh, click on the sun and then drag it you'll notice that um, as I do the the shadows change etc right it's now made uh, a little bit uh, you know it's dark because it's okay so uh, right so it does change the 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 shadows in the sun over there right um, you can also do that uh, if you go to maybe a 3d view uh, I'm going to just look at uh, maybe the kitchen or the living room. Right, so there's the living room. You'll see there's uh, some of the shadows on the at the back there uh, falling in uh, from that side. If I go to the uh, particular sun settings and I go change the sun settings to a different uh, preset that I have here, you'll notice that the shadows uh, adjust according to that uh, preset. Uh, you'll see the time and the date uh, over there. And as I do, it then just changes the um, the particular sun angles in this uh, internal view. All right, so these are presets. Um, there's multi-day and uh, um, uh, different presets that you can set to uh, look at sun studies. Um, if um, harsh sun comes in, uh, winter or summer, and maybe adding shading devices to uh, um, negate that. All right, so you've got different uh, um, abilities to particularly show and present solar analysis and, uh, and that sort of thing. Right, then just uh, briefly talking about your energy analysis, um, if I go to the 3D view, um, obviously the location and that is critical, but if I go then to the, the analysis and I have a energy optimization over here. Right, so there's a location that I can add um, and then um, the first step is to create an energy model and it's this process that uh, the software goes through to um, just look at the rooms that you've placed and these rooms then obviously have certain uh, occupancy etc 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 and that will then get uh, created right obviously you can now change these analytical spaces according to um, you know certain um, information and then what you do is after that you would go and generate your uh, your uh, analytical model. Now what that does, it, uh, it takes quite uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, basically it sends the information from from this analytical model that you've changed up to the cloud. It does a, a certain um, you know, calculation and then what you do is you will receive an email. First that it's been uploaded Right, it's an email looking like that, where uh, once you've uh, said OK to that previous dialog box, it'll send uh, uh, an email and uh, and it'll say, right, OK, great, it has uh, uh, started to, the, to do the analysis. And then once it's done, it will uh, send you a little email uh, looking like this, saying that, OK, great, great, the analysis is complete according to that uh, uh, energy model and if you then go view insight it then opens up a website where by you can look at this uh, building performance right I'll just log in <clears throat> right so once I'm in this um, insight uh, website um, you can uh, look at the model and uh, then at the bottom here you will see various uh, parts that impact the energy uh, usage and uh, of this building and it can be from you know operating schedules you know when the lights are on and off uh, HVAC um, the roofing construction etc 
Uh, if you go there, it'll it'll have certain um, changes that you've made to the roofing and record that. Okay, so um, we didn't make any changes, but um, if you add more insulation, this will drop, and uh, um, it will uh, just you know show you the different uh, information. All right, so there's lots of um, things that you can change now. Just to look at um, uh, another model that uh, uh, that I've um, done in the past. All right, so um, this model that I, that we've done in the past is uh, just uh, it's got a number here. And that number is, you know, the cost per year, uh, that the cost in energy per year. And um, um, and uh, what we've done here is we've changed the roof construction from uh, what it was, this little bit of model history. So we've changed it, uh, and as we change the, the roof construction, it uh, this number that you see here at the top, you know, shrinks. Um, adding more insulation to the roof, and uh, uh, thereby, you know, getting a better result in energy usage. Right. So if I look at the roof construction, um, and it, uh, well, uh, I think yeah. So they uh, can't remember now what uh, what that done. But uh, in and this is the model history. We we did do the the changes of the within the roof construction, and it uh, update the updated the um, the model, um, you know, the costing in there. Right. Um, obviously, this is a different discussion, you know, energy analysis. But at least you've got a starting point, and you can look through the um, and read through that to allow you to um, enhance the cost of your building based on you know certain uh, concepts. All right. So um, okay. So that concludes my part. Um, I've got like twenty minutes uh, to. Uh, to uh, to do, and then um, I'll hand over to my colleague uh, Paul uh, to do uh, the structural and the um, MEP uh, 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 side. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul. I'm the colleague of Shaul. Thank you very much, Shaul, for that wonderful presentation on the architectural aspects of Revit on the demonstration. I'm going to switch over into the structural and the MEP demonstration. And when we talk about Revit, we are really talking about a program that is used to create what I like to call a matchstick model. And in essence, we are drawing up the members, but not so much the detailing or the joints. And it's also not used for structural analysis. External packages are used for this. Revit works in conjunction in the AEC collection from Autodesk with Advanced Steel, which is a steel fabrication package that is built on top of AutoCAD, and with Revit uh, and Robot. And Robot is what we use for the structural analysis. The one thing that Revit is good with is the rebar modeling and you'll find that even with infrastructure projects like bridges the models are typically brought back into Revit so that they can do rebar. We can do a lot of um, objects within Revit. I think this little structural model will demonstrate that very clearly. Floors, walls, roofs, columns, beams, bracing, purlins, foundations as well as footings and rebar and very important in all of this when you are modeling for other purposes for instance fabrication and structural analysis is to use the sections that are relevant to your own country in my case this is South Africa and the content for you to download is online and released by Autodesk and those are sections that are recognized by all three packages and these sections represent sections that you'll be able to purchase from your local supplier. And then just to carry on with what we are going to go through today, not only the modeling of elements, but we will also have a look at how to create a rebar schedule. This is quite a tricky so-and-so. It is something that uh, was passed down to me from somebody within the industry itself that was able to put this together 
and this is a great uh, rebar schedule that you can if you contact micrographics we will be able to help you out with that and that is a typical bending schedule that we might want to have in South Africa we can also have a look at the joints that we get and like it is mentioned within the slide as well that Autodesk Advanced Steel is best used for creating specialized joints and for fabrication drawings it even extends into CNC manufacturing Revit does not do that but it does allow you to at least get some design intent across the structural analysis that is done in robot once you've set up the analytical model and this I suppose is the most difficult part of Revit structural to make sure that the model elements that is being modeled represents also the analytical model that is of interest especially with things like purlins that they have connections if you want to include them in the analysis the application of loads but that this is then returned into the model the Revit model from the external application so that your reaction forces your shear force and bending moment diagrams as well as deflection is available for you as analytical results within Revit. When we're done with the structural part of the demonstration we'll be going on to MEP showing how you can model systems. MEP stands for mechanical, electrical and plumbing <coughs> which include things like gravity fed systems for instance your plumbing grey water and black water and then pressure pipes for instance your tap water that is typically modeled within Revit. Once you get into things like hospitals then there are multiple systems for you to model and it becomes very, really interesting how one manages that but that's for another day. On the mechanical side a lot of the MEP or the HVAC stuff starts with the heating and cooling loads analysis that is not changed in Revit 2022. You won't find the heating and, and, and cooling loads analysis button anymore. But we do have something that is called system analysis. And that can be done within Revit together with the analytical model. Some people use Revit to do that. Other people export the GBXML file or an XML file so that they can do that in an external application at least the model will help them define their control volumes there's electrical systems that may be modeled so that your components are hooked up to an electrical system and then lastly there's also the plumbing side of things so we'll presently show you some of that how that is done within Revit So when one looks at the physical model that one sees in Revit, there's quite a bit that goes into setting up a model like this. Part of that is to import the correct sections. <coughs> and what you'll see is you can do that if you go and insert some families. You can find that from the South African library. And they are your structural framing and columns. They both contain the same steel library for South African specific and there you can find the sections that you bring in and whatever section you bring in you can bring in multiple ones at one time and you can choose the sizes and you can also filter out some of the sizes if you want you can say which sizes you want and then you can select multiple ones between the families and then bring them in we won't do that We've already got the families that we want within our project. And once we bring them in, they'll sit within the library. There are my structural columns. Note that the structural columns are definitely different from the normal columns. And then with beams, they qualify as structural framing. There you can see the structural framing. On the structural rebar side, you can also bring in the structural rebar shapes there you'll recognize if you are from South Africa or South African code shapes shape codes and then also the rebar itself 
So all of that is, those are contained in families. And once you've got all your families loaded, that, that is one part of it. And then especially with MEP projects, or with structural and MEP projects, you also want to go and have a look at your settings. They're available from Manage. Now I've, I've already started placing rebar in this program, but you'll see for instance on your, on your settings for your rebar, you'll find them under your structural tab. And if you do go and have a look at your rebar settings, for instance your cover settings, you can set up different covers, your reinforcement settings and your reinforcement numbers, but there's the rebar settings. Important thing to note is that if you choose to include hooks and rebar in the shape, in the rebar shape definition and heat treatments or end treatments, then you can only do so at the beginning of a project. To reset that means that you have to delete all of your rebar within the project. And there's a lot of settings to go through. And unfortunately, it's like that. You have to first set up a project or template. And then after you've done that, your job will be a lot easier and you'll be able to work at speed with any new project that comes along. Unless, of course, it's in a different country, in which case you also have to set up a template to use their standards, their piping sizes, if it's imperial or metric or what shape codes they use in that country and so on. So there's a lot of setup that goes in. Then, because Revit is a parametric modeling engine, you'll find that setting up a 3D model like this requires you to have some datum elements. They include the levels and the grid lines. So levels, you'll see them very clearly over here in 3D. If you look at a side view, then you'll see how the elements are hooked up to these planes and they are called levels. And looking from above, you, in 3D, you can see also that there are grid lines. And those grid lines define, of course, where columns and so forth, where they might be. The typical sort of center line <coughs> of your columns. And when you create a new project, that would, that would be one of the things that you would like to do. Let's suppose that we want to model something towards the south here. Currently this view is getting cropped. I'm just going to extend these lines quickly. They were increasing the crop area and we're going to maximize the 3D extents of those grid lines. So we would like to have some of the grid line. They're part of our datum elements. See, we'll have to be in a, not a 3D view, but in a 2D view. And I'm just going to copy that element And of course, one would name it appropriately. I'll just increase the numbering. So that it doesn't create a duplicate. And there we've got a, a basic sort of shape in which, in which we might want to model. And that gives us the basis for our project. <coughs> One can easily use parametrics to equispace items as well as pin items in place and move items around based on some other parametric dimension and even lock such a dimension 
and use the dimension to equispace items. And that's typically done with grid lines so that we can control the spacing between them. So that's the first part of it. Then because Revit works as a in a plan view, as a sort of a sliced view, we can structurally we typically draw downwards. However, in architecture we draw upwards. So if we have a look at the levels that are applicable over here, for instance, let's take for instance that we would like to start drawing with the with the with the structural column over there, we'll see that the the levels that define it is from uh, the top of the footing and up to the ground level with a zero offset at the top and a zero offset at the bottom. So we'd like to achieve the same thing in our own drawing. So we might choose to start drawing say at the ground level because we're structural engineers, structural draftsmen. In our families we've got some structural elements including structural columns and there we can see that we've got the rectangular column whatever size it is that we like if we don't have the size that we have then we can duplicate it's like that with most families we can duplicate a family give it a description give it a descriptive name I suppose we had a 600 by 600 and then the only thing that we have to remember is to change the parameter so that we can also have the 600 as the H value. That then defines this column. Dragging it onto the screen or invoking the command gives us the option to place things at grids. And also, do we want to draw up or down? And onto which level? So because I'm currently on the ground level, I may draw down to TOF. And I might say something like at grid intersects. And then I could choose the grid lines where I want to include those columns to be placed. Might also choose to have some footings. And you can find them listed under the category. So it's quite easy to find elements that might be of interest. Let's take a 900 by 900 by 450 and we can say it columns and we select all of those columns and automatically we can find that it is now placed footings and our columns. Items like this for instance the wall foundation, the bearing footing, as well as the footing itself. Typically they are hosted to the columns. And if one should move the if one should move the grid lines, then that will move the columns and the walls and so on with it. So we'll just have to undo the constraint. There we can see it moving. So that's quite nice. With large buildings like parking garages where there's hundreds and sometimes thousands of columns, we usually draw all the columns on the grid lines and then afterwards we choose to delete the ones that we don't want. We can also copy these guys into position. You can constrain them horizontally and vertically as well as create multiple copies at one time. And so we can see, we can start building up our structural columns. And the same goes for the rest of the columns. With the hosted elements for instance, if you can see something then let's suppose you have a look at this uh, structural wall. Here we 
can even select something in 3D. Suppose I'm going to draw something similar to that. And we can right click and create similar. Switch out into the ground level. I'm going to draw down to TAF. Location line is the wall center line. Where join status is allowed. And what we would do is we would try and model these elements as if we are going to build them. That's something that a lot of people make mistake with. Instead of drawing it as a very long wall, you can also then just draw it from column to column. It's a little bit more effort on your side, but definitely worth it. Now you'll see at the moment I'm drawing it sort of downwards. The sense in which you draw the drawing is important. And you'll see that the walls have a little toggle over there. Depending on how your wall is defined with respect to the location line, you can just flip it in place. Now the outside of the wall is in fact to the outside of the wall. One could copy these elements as well. As long as they are the same side, they'll hook up to the rest of the elements. And if you want to draw it in the correct orientation, we just draw it from below up. So basically in a clockwise direction. That will give you a positive sense of the orientation of the wall. And looking up the foundation is as simple as going to the wall foundation and saying that we've got this bearing footing and we just want to hook it up to those walls so we can select multiple walls and we can finish that and there is the structural foundation Now it's quite simple to start modeling in 3D. One may also model elements upwards, so one can copy the clipboard and paste the line to selected levels. And one must remember that this column is drawn down up. So let's suppose we go from the roof level downwards. You can see how the hosted element is copied along with it. There we go down to not the level below it, but to the ground level with a zero offset. Then we can see the column and then it's nice to be able to switch out columns. And then pressing spacebar one can rotate these columns. In the plan view one can rotate them to a very specific orientation and there we can see what they look like beams operate the same way if you see an element like this it's quite tricky to model with it switching out into a medium view or in a coarse view would allow you to see that as a line element quite often. Let's take this through over here. Copy another one over there. And then with the beam <coughs> with the beam elements, we can just draw in that beam. Let's take the roof level for instance. And then we can just draw that beam in. That will be under framing, structural framing. You can give it some other offset. In this case, since it is on the roof level, just draw it straight through. That one was drawn with an offset value. Let's just draw that again. On a line.
and there we can find what it looks like in 3D. You can see it looks like a matchstick model, sort of center to center. And it always helps to have a look at the analytical model to see what's going on. And you can see how the matchstick model is already getting generated. <coughs> often what you'll find is if your model is, if you are going to construct, you might also want to adjust the analytical model so that you can uh, hook it up to the correct place. So in this case, for instance, we might choose to have the analytical model to adjust the wall to select the wall and hook it up to the correct target so that is how we would have to go through a bit of extra work just to set up the model so that it eventually looks something like this where we've got our constraints our walls and so on and ultimately if we do want to add some detail it's quite a lot that goes into a building like this to make it look exactly the same. This is actually somebody's Tecla model that I redrew in Revit to make sure that one could actually do that in Revit. But one can even take it all the way through into modeling rebar. It doesn't play so much of a role in the analytical model and neither does the uh, joints. But you can see how these joints look. So if you take this one for instance, these are joints that can be placed. Typically if you load the joints into the project, and you've got them over there. You can just select the elements that you want and then hook up the connections. It will give you a choice of connections that you're able to use. And Let's just try something like that. It's a gable wall. Not the correct one in this instance. But in this instance you can see that one can hook them up. I just have to load the correct set. We're running a bit short of time here. Let's try to generate this. But it is, it is of course not the correct join. For that one can also go into the settings. In the connections. There are the settings and then one can choose which joints to load into the project. There are the column beams, there's a beam seat T. We've loaded that into the project, we select our members, we generate the connection, and we should find the beam seat T available to us there. And after that one can now go and change the parameters that are available over there. There are the parameters that one can change. And the nice thing about these joints is they do also port into advanced steel. Here you can see all the parameters for the actual joint that you can change. And if you spend a bit of time and effort on that, then you can set that up very nicely for your building so that you end up with something that looks like the items that you see over here. And then lastly also we've got some rebar, 
In the rebar typically you would draw in a sectional view. It's very easy to draw sectional views within Revit. Let's suppose we wanted to draw some rebar in this column over here. We would just draw a little section through there. Usually crisscross that. And one is then able within the sectional view to generate some rebar. There are macros for this as well that you can invest in. Let's go on the placement to go perpendicular to the cover. One can place it. There are some boundaries that help define it. And once one place something one can also go and manipulate it afterwards so that we've got say a minimum clear spacing of a hundred for argument's sake that's now going downwards so when one places these elements one must just be careful how one places this so current work plane near cover reference far cover reference placement perpendicular to cover there we can see if we come in like that it's actually how I wanted this and one can manipulate this into place it likes to snap over there but ultimately one may also choose to edit the constraints and one will find that one may even choose specific elements so that one can manipulate the offset of that element. So let's go with minus 20, then we can move it 20 more down or put it back into position. Rebar elements you can also copy and mirror about somewhere the line that you draw and you also have a visibility graphic override for it that you can choose to use so let's suppose in the physical model that I want to see those rebar elements I will override them so they show within a nice 3D view then that is something that I can do We'll now see the rebar in 3D and that will also help somebody else that's viewing the model or if you want to create a nice 3D view to show how the rebar is set up. And lastly, things like the naming of this base. Uh, if we give it a mark, say hello. And we go and have a look at our rebar schedule. Then we'll see the rebar schedule. There's the hosting member and there's the detailing of the rebar. Like I said, the setup of this is quite interesting. It's quite an involved setup. Something that we can help you as well. But there's filtering, grouping, sorting, formatting and appearance. All comes into play with your schedules. And that's really it in a nutshell. There's a lot that goes on, but it takes more than just a small webinar to demonstrate that. And ultimately, one would then also uh, perform some other an analysis on this and push it through into robot structural analysis and bring the results manager back or even export this into advanced steel for fabrication. Like I said, uh, creating the analytical model, that's part of the challenge and it can be fun as well and there you can also see that we've applied some loads. You can also take this a lot further in Robot but in Revit you do have the ability to create some loads and you can manipulate the size and the, sh the direction from the IJK vectors that present themselves within the properties. So that will just increase the size. There are load cases and load combinations as well. 
um, you can host them on elements or apply them over areas so if you have mechanical equipment and so forth you can include those loads for your um, wind loads and snow and whatever loads you would like to incorporate so a matchstick model with an analytical model you can do a little bit of uh, detailing rebar scheduling definitely and then the analysis would be brought back from robot well, we are running a bit short on time here just like to demonstrate a few things on the mechanical model firstly the control boundaries for the mechanical model are typically made up of links structural and architectural you'll see when I unload the link that the spaces and the regions don't understand how they must generate so the boundaries for the control volumes are generated by the elements that are linked in typically that's how the models work together and in the modern era if we want to generate the heating and cooling loads analysis we use the systems analysis toolbar where we can either generate well we have to generate the analytical model and after the analytical model is created then we would do the system analysis or the whole building analysis it's also based on the location that the project is in it takes the the typical you can see you can run the analysis running the analysis creates a report and opening that report will then run the analysis itself you can see that it's calculating in the background but in any case setting the location of the project allows you to or re what it does is it reads the the general um, climate from meteorological data okay and after a while you can see it will then come up with the report which you can then investigate and see how one can make improvements to the design It's quite a work, quite a lot of work that goes into setting up the model, but that is then how we analyze the design. So just on the mechanical model, <coughs> once again, typically we don't remodel building elements. We use Revit links. So you'll see, for instance, that the architectural elements in here, it's all from a Revit link. And switching that off will just expose all the in this case an MEP model which includes mechanical, electrical and plumbing and there we can see the various different systems that are included in this model the air terminals that give the required flow rate into the rooms all connected via ducting and as one tabs through the system one can see what is connected to each other so that is the physical system just like with the structural system where we have a physical and an analytical system so within the mechanical systems we have these systems that have a logical connection looking at a piping system for instance we have a fire protection system and there we can see everything that is connected to the fire protection system let's see if we can isolate that there we can see what the fire protection system looks like <coughs> and if we know what the flow rates on the components are and we can input those we'll see that it's got mechanical properties that we can see what the system flow will be the 
is our sprinkler element that's the leaf of the system and we'll be able to see the flow rate of two liters per second and that then propagates through the system and the pipe sizing is done according to some relations that give us the pipe sizing as well drawing pipes and ducts are very much the same and uh, if you understand how to draw one element be it a pipe or a duct then you can draw the others and once you know what you're doing you can even do so in 3D and depending on how the pipe is set up the pipe system is set up will even give you the correct connection and you can see how that works if you go into the settings for the ducting systems in this case so looking at this system here it's supply air that's the duct systems and there's the duct itself this looks like oval duct metered elbows and taps mitered elbows and taps and if we have a look at the type properties we will see that they've got routing preferences and within that are the fitting families that they will use and then on the deduct side itself we see that we can input the sizes and whether they are used in size lists or in sizing and there's an enormous amount of setup that happens within Revit MEP including also our electrical systems they work on the same principle and you will find the settings over here under mechanical that's for panel schedules which you can also balance and they are our electrical settings where one would set up the voltages and the wire sizes and so forth very important are the voltages that you input as well as the distribution systems in this case there's not much set up within this file but it's very important because of your connectors on your electrical systems we do provide an MEP course where we run through all of these systems I think it's a bit much to demonstrate just in a short demonstration but if you know how to draw one system then all everything else falls in place and again the Revit help files are a great help with that just a reminder that if you do want to get into contact to learn more about uh, Revit <coughs> and now we can go about using that in whatever discipline you are practicing please contact Micrographics so that we may be of assistance to you With that, thank you from Sean and myself. And let's see if there are any further questions. We'll hope to see you at the next webinar.